All right. Just going to wait one more minute for everyone to, to join and, and get, get set up. All right, I think we will get started. It's three o'clock. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, this is a Danish sign cluster webinar and the, the subject is um, online hearing rehabilitation. So we have uh, four exciting guests today and we also have uh, a moderator, which is Biro Schneider, our uh, chairman of the Danish sign cluster. Um, but before we jump into it, I'll just give you a few practical tips. Um, we have two different chats. The regular chat is just for comments, but if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A, um, and then we will take the questions after each presentation. Um, and we are recording this session today, so we will send out the presentations and the recording afterwards. Um, so you have that and you can share it with colleagues or other people who perhaps couldn't make it today. So yeah, let's get started. Uh, thank you very much, Biro, for moderating today. Thank you, Jelly. Uh, as uh, you are probably very well aware, uh, hearing healthcare is a very strong Danish discipline since uh, many years. And hearing healthcare is also developing very rapidly for the time being. And it's now possible to offer uh, clients a virtual consultation for those are not able to uh, meet up in person. However, there are uh, a lot of questions uh, related to that. Are such solutions as good as the ones that you, you get when you actually show up physically? What are the features that are included in such solutions? Are there limitations? And what can new technology bring to improve even beyond what we can do today? These are some essential questions that we will hear a lot about today. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are very fortunate to have uh, four extremely competent persons to help us in shedding light on, on current practices and virtual consultations, and also provide some details on uh, what we can expect of the developments. So, and finally, I also hope we have a little time to discuss what we do with all the data that may be available. But our first presenter, is uh, Dr. Erika Köhler. Uh, Erika Köhler is uh, uh, the audiology concepting lead within GN Hearing's global audiology team in Chicago, USA. Uh, she has 14 years of experience in hearing and product development with uh, special attention to software. She works within interdisciplinary research and development and marketing teams. Uh, with the goal of improving experiences uh, for those on their journey in hearing loss rehabilitation. So, Erica, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pull up my presentation here. And remember to check to share sound. All right. So, if there is any issue, Seeing the slides, please do let me know. Give me a shout out. Um, I am in presentation mode, so you literally have to give me a shout out in order for me to tell that I'm um, not sharing. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to talk about hearing healthcare meeting telehealth. So I'm going to spend a Erica, little bit of time. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we can't see your your slides at the moment. Ah, there we go. See, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's take a look. Are you able to see anything? <laughs> no. Okay, it's just gray or black. Okay, let me try again. That's it. Now yeah. we can there see we the screen. All right, how's that? Brilliant. Better? It's great. Yeah. Okay, it looks better on my end too. It looks a little odd before. Okay, so getting started. Like I mentioned, I wanted to talk about um, 
telehealth. And I, I, instead of just talking about solutions, I think it's really important before talking about solutions is to talk about why. So why telehealth? Why are we talking about it now? How long has it been around? Where do we have the need for the te for telehealth and who plans on using it? Or um, are we in R&D developing solutions because we think they're cool and um, our end users are, are not interested? So let's just start with talking about why. So um, as a healthcare professional, and as many of you are out there as well, we've come such a long way from adjusting hearing aids with a simple screwdriver to now becoming a tech support for our patients. So we're having to deal with their phones and their connectivity, their apps, their TVs, something that we probably never inspired to do or even dreamed of. Um, and it's a lot of, it takes a lot of time. It's a lot of burden, mental stress, um, knowing that our patients are struggling and we want to help them. But um, the question is, for some people, this as technology evolves, is it worth the time in the clinic to set them up with all these um, gadgets and solutions and apps? It, do they use them? Do they enjoy them? Does it give them benefit? Um, if we set them up with too much technology, is our, are our careers and our jobs at risk? Um, these are all questions that we'll kind of touch on today and look at some data. So we live in an age of instant gratification where um, people are used to having um, access to shopping and information literally at their fingertips. Um, we have our smartphones in our pockets and they've become our personal assistants, our stores, our televisions, our computers, um, the list goes on and on and on. But the catch is, is these aren't just considered for tech savvy individuals anymore. I like to have you look at some pretty compelling data we have here. Um, I just wanna start by saying that, that there's over 250 million adults in the US to just try to keep that in mind when you're looking at these numbers. So we're talking about large numbers of people when we're generalizing data over a population that size. So if you see here that it says 85% of Americans um, are using or own smartphones, 61% of them are over 65. So that sort of debunks that theory that only younger or tech savvy individuals are having smartphones and that older individuals aren't interested or do not use smart devices or apps. This um, survey is representative of um, over 1500 respondents. It's repeated every two years, the smartphone and cell phone data information. So that's where we get this nice graph here. And if you look at that green line, you can see that there's a sharp increase. Um, some year from some survey to survey, we have increases of almost 10% in just two years, or even in some cases in just one year. So the adaptation of cell phones is increasing at a rapid, rapid rate to the point where we may see this number approaching almost 100% um, in, in the not far future. So when we think of older individuals and cell phone technology or smart technology, um, we might ask, ask ourselves why or what's the incentive or um, what is the value in investigating that. So if we look at the top of the slide here, um, I do have a study from AARP, which is the American Association of Retired Persons. This study was um, published in 2019. It's also a survey of over 2,400 respondents. Um, 41, 40 percent of them indicated that they would use um, their smart devices for medical information um, in terms of notifying or providing medical information to their clinicians. Um, and 21 percent said that they would use it for actual video visits from their home. So if we're talking about, well, is this just a matter of convenience? The study actually was talking about um, smart homes as well. And the incentive for the older individual to have um, this type of technology, whether it be smartphone or telehealth, is the ability to stay in the home longer. So people don't want to have to move later in life into um, a retirement facility or a, a long-term care facility. They'd rather stay in their home. And this type of technology is um, assisting people in the ability to do that. They're able to stay in their own homes by using technology, not having to go to doctor appointments and having um, the appointment come to them. If you look on the lower half of the screen, 
These studies are a little bit older, but I think that they're worth pointing out and they're still valuable. They're from when telehealth was starting to emerge and apps were starting to come out in, in regards to healthcare. And these are not hearing healthcare apps specifically, but they're apps about diabetes management and sm smoking secession. And I think that it's interesting that to just point out that patients love apps. So even in the cases where the clinician didn't agree that they thought that there was clinical or objective results that supported the patient using the app, the patient themselves liked having the app. And I think that that's important because that shows that the patient is engaged in their healthcare. They're taking some initiative, they're taking some action while they're at home outside of the doctor's office or outside of the appointment. So engaged patients are actually associated with um, lower costs to the healthcare system. So there, there is data to support that. So when we're talking about telehealth or bringing the patient in into an, an app or something that can help them manage their, their situation on their own, it doesn't just benefit the patient, it also benefits the provider and the system as a whole is resulting in um, less overall costs to the system. So if we look specifically at apps that are related to hearing healthcare, we have some of our own data here from GN with over 10,000 participants that kind of just bolsters that idea of, engage, of, of engagement. Um, this is a satisfaction survey. So uh, we surveyed people that had only hearing aids in their hearing healthcare solution, um, a hearing aid paired with an accessory, which could be a, um, a, a mini microphone or a TV streamer, and then with the app. And the satisfaction rating was significantly higher for those that included the app in their hearing ecosystem. So we can tell that people like to have this control and this freedom at their fingertips, um, which goes with the mentality of today. But um, much of the data I pre presented so far has been on a little bit on the older side, but when we consider how our lives have changed recently with the pandemic. So that was pre-pandemic data. So now we'll get into some more current data with the effects of the pandemic. So as everything shut down, you can see the sharp increase here on, on the screen in those that are using remote solutions. And um, this actually talks about synchronous solutions. And when I say synchronous solution, I mean that the clinician and the patient are both together on a call at the same time. Um, and this is across disciplines too, when we're looking at, at this survey data here. And as, oops, as we can see that there's that sharp incline when everything sort of closed down, there were no options for in-office appointments. But then as things reopened, we did see it decrease again, um, but there was a leveling off and we didn't see it return back to the pre-pandemic state, which was nearly zero. So we're looking at about 38 times the amount of patients that are using these virtual visits compared to um, prior to COVID. So I think that we can say that these video visits have made a place for themselves regardless of, um, of lockdown or not. They're sort of here to stay. All right, so now that we've talked about all of these great things that remote and tele and giving patients their own freedom can, can afford us, what if we look at, at, at the complete um, handover of hearing healthcare to the patient? What if we give them full control and we take the clinician out of the picture? Um, I think that this is an interesting study because this is one of several that looks into that question exactly. So after patients um, in this study, which were 80, there were both experienced users and new users to hearing aids included here. Uh, received a hearing evaluation. They were then um, propositioned with the idea of a self-fitting hearing aid. And then they were give, give, asked to give their opinion on that after the idea was presented. And 83% thought that it was a good idea. They liked the idea. Um, but the major draw, drawbacks would be that they wouldn't have the expertise or the assistance of the clinician. So they liked the ability to have some of the freedom and adjust the hearing aid themselves have some of the conveniences that remote affords, but they were not completely ready to give away their clinician um, at that time. And I think that this 
really matches up with that AARP data that we looked at in the beginning because that study also mentioned that there needed to be a balance. There needed to be a balance between um, having the clinician and then also giving the patient some control and convenience um, outside the clinic instead of forcing them to make appointments and return back to the clinic as frequently. So for those in the audience that may not be hearing healthcare clinicians, I just want to discuss what do hearing healthcare clinicians do? So um, we know at this point, after looking at the data, that all of these tasks um, can have, they do have impact from the patient and the clinician. So it's important to consider both sides, but a typical clinician, um, depending on scope of practice, will diagnose hearing loss. They'll do visual inspections of the ear. They'll advise and recommend appropriate amplification. Um, they'll select and fit the amplification for the patient. As I mentioned at the very beginning, there's often a lot of other uh, technology solutions that are involved in this um, nowadays. And then they'll also do a lot of counseling on treatment and expectations for the patient. So as you can see, there's a lot of things in this list, and this list looks quite short, even though we could probably add sub, many, many subcategories under each of these headlines here. But as you can imagine, a lot of time is spent here. There's a lot of counseling and talking and working with the patient. So as you could see, there, there is a need for the clinician. And I always say that um, fitting hearing aids is like an art and a science. There's a lot of objective data and a lot of opinion that you need to put together with the, the tools that your hearing solution offers and kind of put them all in, in a nice package for the patient and make it seem, seem easy. Okay, so here is another study um, that is coming actually from the other end. So this isn't surveying the patient, this is surveying the clinicians. And this is a retrospective study on where they spent their time during hearing aid follow-up appointments. Um, again, we have a short list of just four bullet points here of what they were spending their minutes on in a follow-up appointment. But again, there's so many activities under each one of these things. So if we, if we think about hearing aid management, this could be um, charging the hearing aid, cleaning the hearing aid, putting the hearing aid on the ear, off the ear, um, talking about programs, switching programs, the app. If, we, if we're talking about information and training, there's a lot of information and, um, about the warranty, um, payment, things like that, talking about sound quality. So as you can see, there, there's a lot of activities that could go underneath just these four bullet points here, but that just sort of lends itself to how complex fitting a hearing aid is. It isn't like putting on a pair of glasses and suddenly everything becomes bright and clear for everybody. The way the hearing aids are mini computers behind the ear and how complex sound environments can be, how the brain works, this can all be very challenging for the patient and the clinician. But I thought that there was an interesting point here in this article is when um, faced with all of these challenges with fitting and follow-ups at a, a hearing aid appointment, this article was recommending to focus on hearing aid management. And that was the most impactful of the group here. And that's because the most effective hearing aid is the hearing aid that a patient will wear. So that's where they're recommending that they, they meaning the clinician should spend their time because that was the most impactful to the appointment. Um, I, along with giving information and training and spending time um, with the patient on hearing aid management, I'd also like to point out a Kessel study from 2003 that notes that much of the information that's provided at any type of medical appointment is lost or misremembered. And so much it's 40 to 80% of the information. So although something may have been presented once or even twice to a patient, it might not stick. And then that is cause for follow-up visits and reminders. But if you put the right tool in the right place, that could help alleviate some of the time and stress both on the clinician and the patient. So providing them with tools for independence to manage some of these categories here 
just gives a responsibility to both. So a shared responsibility in hearing healthcare for the clinician and the patient, um, and not just relying mostly on the clinician um, with the in-office appointments and having the patient return to the office for each one of these things every single time. Okay, so if we're talking about what happens at an appointment, how are we spending our time? Let's talk about the tools that we have at our disposal. So I'm just gonna flash a couple items up here on the screen from um, our SmartFit software to just talk about the tools. So the tools in the fitting software are used to program and customize the fitting for the individual patient. So we call tools features typically in the software. And as you can see, some of them are quite easy to use. Some of them are more complex. This is a, a shot of the gain adjustment screen. We have many advanced features here with different levels. Um, here's the tinnitus sound generator. So another tool that the clinician has at their disposal when programming a hearing aid for an individual. And then finally, we have the streaming. So um, again, kind of an art and a science where you're putting all of these things together for the patient to make the right experience for them. And again, some of these, it's okay to give to the patient. It's okay to let them adjust their noise reduction or maybe their microphone setting or give themselves a little bit of boost in the high pitches or take down the overall volume a little bit. So again, shared responsibility can result in a more engaged patient and higher satisfaction and less of a burden on the clinician. So if we take a look at um, remote solutions that are offered by GN, we have a list here and they come in various forms. So we have um, an independent app that the patient has for their listening situations to do quick um, changes while they're in the situation instead of trying to remember to go back to the clinician. We have remote fine tuning, which is an asynchronous solution. So if you imagine this one kind of more of like an email or a text message where there's a back and forth between the clinician and an adjustment of the settings, but the clinician and the patient are not together on the system at the same time. And then finally, the live assist solution, which is the synchronous solution, meaning that the clinician and the patient are together on a telehealth visit, mo more like a FaceTime phone call. Okay, so here's just um, a quick shot of the app. Again, it just allows the patient to have some control and some of that instant gratification that we expect now with technology um, right at their fingertips to get them through a tough listening situation. They have these tools right in their pocket. We have the remote tuning. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a screenshot of um, the dashboard. And is, if you look at that gray shaded box, you can see that there was a request that was sent in, there was fine tunings made, fine tunings were sent to the patient, patient loaded them from the apps of the hearing aids and was able to use that um, change in setting the next time they were out in the environment that they experienced difficulty in. And then I get the um, feedback seeing that my patient has accepted the fine tuning. And then finally, we have the live assist and synchronous solution. Um, I have a short video just demonstrating this and I will start that now. I did have the sound check, so you should be able to hear. I'm gonna demonstrate the Resound Live Assistance feature. I have the fitting software open that I mentioned earlier and this was used to program the hearing aid at the initial fitting that the patient would have had in person in the office. But right now I'm gonna simulate my patient being away from the office and needing assistance. However, myself as the clinician is in the office. So I'm gonna go ahead and start by clicking Start Live Assistance. My patient is at home with the app and the hearing aids. It's verifying my microphone and my video as this is a live video call and it's connecting to the phone. I'll be playing the patient side and the clinician side. As you can hear the phones ringing on the other side, on the patient side. So I've answered the phone call for my patient who today is going to be my little skeleton yoga plant that's on my desk because we are still working remotely and he will be my patient. 
So the first thing I need to do after talking with my patient and saying hi, good day, um, is to connect the hearing aids, just like I would in the office, but of course this is being done remotely. So I'm gonna press connect. And my skeleton <coughs> friend's hearing aids will be found through the app. And I'm gonna press continue. Now my patient, who I'm on a live video call with, as I can show you as I put my hand there in front of the phone, um, it's hard to tell because he's not moving, but he's told me that soft sounds are not quite loud enough for him. So I'm gonna go ahead and adjust the loudness for soft sounds in his hearing aid by turning up the gain just a bit. Now he can actually hear those changes live. And we have a little chat and he tells me they're okay. He also told me that he um, realized that he might need a music program added um, after he left the office because he enjoys listening to music and wants a truer sound quality. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that music program for him now. And as you can see, that's been added. And this is happening again live to the hearing instruments as I'm doing it here in the office and my skeleton patient is at home. Okay, and he says that this sounds good and that's all he really needed for today. So I'm gonna go ahead and save the settings to his hearing instruments. And now this is going to set this um, permanently. So when he disconnects, he will have the changes made to his hearing instruments. He'll have an added program that he can see in his app and he'll have that loudness boost for soft sounds. Okay, so my save has been complete, and now I can disconnect the hearing instruments, but continue with my video call. All right, Sir Skeleton, is there anything else I could do for you today? No, that sounds good. Great. So now um, either he can from his side of the app or I can disconnect the call here. And we'll say goodbye to each other till next time. All right. Okay, so in summary, um, we have uh, the remote benefits include independence for the patient. So this could be living at home longer and, and having things at your fingertips to assist you in doing so. It could be changing settings to your patient or um, patients changing settings to their hearing aids in the moment or getting help um, outside the clinic. It increases patient engagement and satisfaction. Um, we have independent solutions, which are the app, this, and then both the synchronous and asynchronous options for the patient. Um, it involves both technology and the human touch, as we have seen several studies um, ask for the blending of both. And then the opportunity for the clinician to focus on more valuable tasks. So again, when there's a shared responsibility for hearing healthcare between the clinician and the patient, and there's more of a balance, then um, we see more success. So thank you so much for spending your time with me and looking at our data and solutions about hearing healthcare. And I will um, stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, uh, Erica. It was very, uh, it was very nice to see how the whole system works. Uh, we have two short questions here, which you may be able to help us on. There's one from Karasuna Dragon. Uh, are there any features that you can adjust only from feeding software and not via the remote care? Uh, um, so there's a couple of features that are disabled during the remote care. It's very, very few. Um, there are ones that do require equipment in the office, basically. So you cannot do... Um, the test mode for test box measurements, because of course the patient wouldn't or shouldn't have a test box at home. The real ear system is disabled because again, you need the equipment in the office to be able to do that. But otherwise um, you can use in situ and do audiometry over live assist. All of the features are enabled. The other thing that you can't do is change or switch hearing aids outside the office. So the initial fit should take place in the office. Um, it, you cannot send a patient another set of hearing aids directly from the factory and then connect those through the live assistance for fitting. 
And thank you. And there's, uh, we'll take just one more question to you. There's one from Pauline O'Callaghan asking for the remote care demo. If the patient was tech savvy, uh, is there any reason uh, they couldn't do that on their own? Um, is there any reason they couldn't do the remote assist? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that the the live assistance is probably the most um, patient friendly and intuitive solution because it's just like a video chat. So if the patient has had any sort of other telehealth visits or um, even chats with friends or family, it operates the same way. So as long as they answer the phone call when the clinician calls, it just kind of moves right through the flow for the patient. They really don't need to do anything on their side other than have the app installed and then answer the phone call from the clinician when it comes in. Um, the other solutions require a little bit more on the patient to make adjustments. The asynchronous solution that I discussed, which was like almost a text message or an email, they do have to work through a questionnaire and provide information to the clinician if they want to send a request and then upload the, the settings to the hearing aid. So I think if somebody is um, on the lower end of tech savvy, I would recommend the live assist option because it really doesn't require much effort on their part. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you. And uh, you will be on the discussion later on. So uh, we will move on. And the next uh, presenter is uh, Lena Dal Sigel. Lena uh, is an ENT specialist and PhD student from Aalborg University Hospital. ENT means uh, ear, nose, and throat. Uh, her previous research includes analysis of ePro data app applicability as a measuring tool for symptom relief in children with otitis media undergoing uh, tympano stomach uh, tube insertion. And she has also engaged in ENT specialist guide, guideline adherence. Uh, just uh, if you don't know all the acronyms, uh, the Otitis Media is a group of inflammatory diseases of, of the middle ear. And uh, tympanal stomach tube insertion is a drain tube insertion in the eardrum to reduce occurrences of ear infections and allow drainage. Uh, Lena uh, is uh, currently managing a cross-sectional clinical trial project, which is the one that we'll be hearing of, of today. And the project is called INHERE, and it aims to investigate patient safety, treatment quality and satisfaction. Uh, the INHERE project is uh, a new digital and remote ENT specialist assessment routine in adult first-time users. So uh, the in-ear project is the topic of her presentation today. So Lena, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I just unmuted and now I'll share my screen and um, hopefully you can see it now. It's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, and I'll just adjust here. So, um, well, thank you very much, Biwa, and thank you to the Danish Sound Cluster for inviting me to this very interesting event to talk about our project called In Here, which is short for Innovation of Hearing Rehabilitation and Effects of Reform. As Biwa said, my name is Lena Dale Siegel, and I'm an ear, nose, and throat abbreviated ENT specialist at the Department of uh, Otto Rhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery and Audiology at Olbo University Hospital in Olbo. And also currently uh, I'm a PhD student and then I'm managing this rather large uh, in here project. But as you can see on this next slide, uh, I'm certainly not alone to steer the project. I cooperate with some very uh, dedicated and extremely skillful people. And here you see some of my closest to most important uh, research colleagues from the departments in Olbo. Um, the project is sponsored by the Danish Health and Medicines Authority. You can see the Danish logo on the left of the screen, where I, by the way, also have some very uh, um, strong and forceful collaborators to the project. 
And then, of course, uh, another sponsor, the North Denmark Region and uh, Olbo uh, University Hospital. I'm also proud to say that in here is a rather, uh, you know, very relevant and rather successful example of a potent cross-sectional uh, cooperation between the private and the public sector in Danish hearing healthcare. And it includes about uh, five public hearing clinics in the Denmark North region and 12 private uh, hearing rehabilitation clinics, as you can see on the screen. Uh, also, we collaborate with three ENT specialist clinics and then four uh, hearing aid suppliers, and they have all really contributed to uh, very significantly to this project to make it even happen. So. Um, yeah, so before I go into detail about the project, I want to offer you some background information about the origin of the project. So I'll just click on, and it may not be, I mean, it's probably no surprise, the Danish hearing healthcare system has been criticized for its structural inefficiency and sometimes belated initiation of hearing rehabilitation in hearing impaired individuals. Uh, waiting lists are long and Audiometries are often repeated multiple times before treatment can be initiated. And as we all know, delayed or insufficient hearing rehabilitation, it can negatively affect quality of life, such as increasing the risk of dementia, anxiety, uh, social distancing, and even early retirement from the labor market. And also, the older population is growing, and according to the demographic changes that we're all witnessing, it will continue to do so over the next decades, and so will the need for hearing rehabilitation. And consequently, the hearing healthcare system as we know it today may uh, fail to accommodate the need for hearing rehabilitation in the future. So to remedy the situation, a national initiative called Hearing Rehabilitation in the Future, you can see the front page of the initiative in Danish on the left, was proposed by the Danish Ministry of Health in 2018. And the idea was to improve hearing rehabilitation in Denmark. And the first of six approaches was the introduction of a new remote assessment, ENT assessment model that would enable ENT specialists to perform remote patient assessments more flexibly and more efficiently, but without having to consult the patient physically. So the most Danes, as it is today, wish to benefit from a personal subsidy, which is a sum of money granted by the state to cover some of the expenses when acquiring hearing aids. And to do so as a first time consumer, you of course need an audiological examination, but you also need a physical ENT specialist assessment performed prior to treatment initiation, and this is in accordance with current regulations. But the new assessment model, as presented in, in here, replaces this physical interaction between the patient and the doctor and replaces it with a standardized examination package performed by audiologists or audiology assistants, and then followed by this digital, remote, non-physical, asynchronous ENT specialist assessment. But to accept this type of assessment model, it is firstly very important to ensure patient safety. It is essential not to risk overlooking serious conditions that need highly specialized care. And therefore one of INHERE's primary goals are to test the efficacy and uh, safety of this new assessment model, this new remote assessment model as a screening tool for so-called severe or complicating hearing loss or complicating conditions that need specialized assessment and treatment in an audiology hospital department. Um, secondly and thirdly, uh, the new remote assessment model must provide the same level of patient experienced uh, treatment quality and satisfaction as the existent, uh, assisting uh, uh, assessment routine does. So we also wanted for this project to investigate patient uh, satisfaction and treatment quality of the new uh, remote assessment routine. So these are the aims of our in here project. Uh, the study population size was calculated based on 
statistical considerations. And we found that we needed 750 participants to adequately test this new assessment routine and compare it with a conventional routine in a control group. And um, we uh, recruited 751 participants through social media advertisement on Facebook. And you can see our ad here. It's no longer active because we actually recruited all our participants in only six months, which is so much faster than we had dared to expect, which was really nice, of course. And this red line, as you can see, show, shows the click on link activity on our Facebook ad. And then the purple line coming here shows the recruitment rate. And we also developed a web page that would kind of uh, assist the uh, advertisement ad on Facebook. Um, of course, all participants were thoroughly informed uh, and they signed a consent form before entering the project. And after they were subsequently randomized in to evenly into three groups. And I wanna show you the project design here. As you can see on the left, after randomization, we had two groups testing the new assessment model. And then we had a third control group that followed the conventional, the current assessment routine. All test group one participants were examined and also treated in private hearing rehabilitation clinics and test group two participants in public hearing rehabilitation clinics. Um, and I think I'll go on presenting the study design based on its stages. So I'll start with stage one, the examination stage. Uh, we had our test group participants and they were examined by audiologists or audiology assistants and then subsequently assessed remotely and asynchronously by a panel of four ENT specialists. Uh, the control group participants, they were examined and then following the assessed physically by private practicing ENT specialists. And this is in, in accordance with current practice, of course. Um, we had the stage two, the treatment stage. And here, you know, after the assessment stage, we had all participants divided roughly into three treatment categories. As you can see, there was a no hearing loss category, a simple hearing loss category, and then a complicated hearing loss category. And the test group participants with no hearing loss or normal hearing, they were prior to project termination uh, assessed physically again, uh, this time physically by an ENT specialist at the Department of Audiology in Aalborg, and this was to ensure that no complicating conditions were overlooked. Um, the control group participants with normal hearing, they were terminated without further actions. The simple hearing loss category from the test groups uh, you know, acquired hearing aids from the same public or private uh, clinic that they, that they were examined or, or tested or examined in. Um, in, in contrast to the control group that if they had a simple hearing loss, got to choose themselves if they wanted treatment in a public or in a private hearing clinic, which is in accordance with how things are done today. And then lastly, uh, regardless of group affiliation, actually, all participants with complicated or severe uh, hearing loss or complicating conditions, they were all referred to the Department of Audiology in Olbo, um for further uh, examination or treatment. And this is the, the treatment group that we were particularly interested in because we were keen to see if this new remote assessment model correctly identified participants with complicating hearing loss or conditions. And the final stage, stage three, I call it the ENT assessment or follow-up stage. We had all participants who had hearing aids administered during their course program, the study program, they were all, uh, they all partook in um, physical ENT gold standard uh, assessment two to three months after treatment initiation. And I'll get back to the meaning of this final ENT assessment um, follow-up. So I want to go back and elaborate a bit further on this standardized examination package from the stage one, the examination stage. And um, this is uh, the package that all our test group participants had performed. They were performed by experienced audiology assistants or audiologists, and it had three elements in it, a medical history, uh, an audiometry, of course, and then a video otoscopy. And I want to take all elements and kind of talk to them, talk about them separately. 
But first I wanna show you, I mean, this goes for the focused medical history as well, but you know, we had different questionnaires and surveys throughout the study and they were all sent uh, by email to each participant. And then you could, you know, press on the link and it opened up the questionnaire and they could answer the questionnaire at home from their phone or computer or iPad. So it was really uh, easy to use. Um, the medical history in this standardized examination package was obtained by using a Danish adapted version of this questionnaire called CEDRA. It's short for Consumer Ear Disease Risk Assessment. And it's an American self-screening tool created to detect the presence of 104 targeted ear diseases in adult first-time hearing aid users. And it's meant to help the, help the consumer self-assess um, their risk of disease before acquiring hearing aids. And um, as you can see here, the questionnaire has 15 items with yes, no, and multiple choice questions all relating to hearing and balance, uh, also general health and, and other non-otological symptoms, such as uh, vision impairment or reoccurring fever that could occur with uh, hearing issues uh, in some of these targeted ear diseases. And as you can see on page three, the tool provides a scoring system to help the consumer predict the risk of disease that need medical attention. And based on previous studies, uh, it recommends the cutoff score of four if this tool is used, utilized exclusively. But as it was used in an extended examination package in INHERE, we uh, applied a cutoff score of eight or greater to increase specificity of the tool. The second element of the standardized uh, examination package was the audiometry, of course, and the quality of this test performed in uh, our test group participants matched the required standards as described in the Danish executive order of hearing aid treatment. And that also meant that all participating, participating private hearing rehabilitation clinics had all been approved by Forest Technologies Laboratory. And the test of course contained air and bone conduction uh, thresholds, uh, speech discrimination test, an acoustic reflex test, and of course, a tympanometry as well. And the idea was to utilize or apply this test throughout the entire study program, also for the fitting, so we didn't have to unnecessarily make test repetitions. All right, and the last element was the video otoscopy. And this was supposed to replace the medically performed otomicroscopy that is uh, performed by doctors. In this slide, you can see my good colleague and my main supervisor, Morten, performing a video autoscopy of me. But in, in here, our test participants had it performed by audiology assistants, and the still images of the inner ear canal and the eardrum were subsequently assessed remotely and digitally by our panel of remote ENT specialists. So in order to actually use or apply these images as intended as a substitute for our otomicroscopy performed by doctors. It was very important that the images were of high quality and maximum sharpness and showed the entire eardrum. And I'll, I'll do admit, I'll, I will admit that there, there's a learning curve uh, to this procedure and not all our still, uh, the still images in our project lived up to this level of quality and sharpness. However, if it is performed skillfully and correctly, this procedure has a very uh, put, a big potential of actually being uh, a usable uh, substitute for the ultramicroscopy in this setting. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the remote assessment process. Um, we had a panel of our four ENT specialists comprising two medical audiologists and two uh, private ENT specialists, and they each assessed all the 500 it's supposed to say 501 <laughs> uh, test participants individually. So, and then we had, I'll show you just have a little animation. We had an automatic random algorithm determining which of the four ENT assessment, uh, specialist assessments would apply for each of the participants in case of assessment differences between the four. And again, as I said before, the specialist divided the test group participants roughly into these three treatment categories based on the standardized uh, examination package results. 
uh, normal hearing, simple hearing loss, and complicated hearing loss. And I kind of simplified the process a bit on this slide, but the specialists were actually able to nuance their assessment decision by adding elaborating comments to the decision in our uh, database. And uh, I just have a little uh, video here just to show you how that would work in, you know, in the project. They would sit at home, they would enter the database, they would open the files for the audiometry test and the pictures from the video otoscopy. Of course, they would also have access to the score from the medical history, the CETRA, which is called Rehab in Danish, the Danish adapted version. And then they would, oh, did I stop it? You can see it again, it's very short. Um, and then they would, uh, you know, upload their assessment decision in our in the database, and they would, you know, you know, add some elaborating comments, and then we, we could enter the database to see what they would have decided, and let the patient be further in their the study program. So that's kind of the that's how how we did it in practice in this in this setting. Yeah. So that was just a very short video. Um, we did have some ideas on how to interpret the results from the standardized examination package before the project even began. And based on this idea, we, we kind of developed a digital referral algorithm prototype. And I won't go into detail with it now. I just wanted to present the idea to you that we're going to compare this algorithm that I'm showing you here to the reality of remote ENT specialist assessments in the test group participants in our project just to see whether this algorithm and the reality differ significantly. And of course, this is an ongoing analysis. We're not completely done with collecting data. However, we do have several ideas for improving this algorithm, which could be like the initial steps towards an AI model in the ENT specialist assessments. Okay, so elaborating a bit further on stage three, uh, the gold standard ENT assessment, and I'm not the one that did all these assessments, I'm just the only model we had, it was during the pandemic, there were no other people available, so that's why I'm figuring all these pictures, but of course we had colleagues, specialists, ENT uh, specialists within OTO, uh, within ear, uh, the, ear uh, the hearing area uh, of the specialty, performing these ENT assessments. And the idea was that all participants, regardless of group affiliation, who all had hearing aids administered during their study program, they partook in this physical ENT uh, gold standard examination and consultation. And um, this was the assessment uh, against which all previous assessments remote and physical in the control group also were compared um, and that allowed us to um, kind of uh, uh, assess uh, the, the new assessment routine, calculating a sensitivity and specificity of the new routine as a screening tool for complicating hearing loss, complicated, complicating conditions that needed highly specialized care. And we could also calculate sensitivity and specificity of the current routine, uh, the conventional routine we use today. And by comparing the two routines by sensitivity and specificity, we could determine, or that's the idea, we can determine whether remote assessment, ENT specialist assessment is inferior, equal to, or maybe even superior to what we know today. So that's the idea of this final stage ENT assessment. And as I said earlier, we also collected um, ePro data to investigate patient satisfaction and uh, treatment quality. And these are some of the tools that we used. Uh, we uh, used the well-known and well-tested speech, spatial, and qualities of hearing scale, SSQ12, at stage one before treatment or examination and stage three after uh, treatment. We uh, utilize the international outcome inventory for hearing age at stage three, that's the third line, to evaluate hearing uh, the uh, effect of hearing aids. We logged uh, hearing aid usage time at stage three, which was two to three months after treatment initiation. And then satisfaction for satisfaction, um, uh, we used the validated satisfaction questionnaires from what is called the Danish National patient reported experience measures from 2021. And we use that questionnaire at all three stages. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so just very shortly, we, util we utilize the REDCAP um, 
uh, application uh, for registering and keeping all our data electronically. It's perfect for building and administering databases and online surveys. And it's, uh, you know, very, it meets all requirements for handling uh, personal health data. So this is a very uh, useful tool for us in this uh, setup. And this is just like a dynamic flowchart. I wanted to show you how far we are because we're not finished yet. We're still ongoing. As I said before, we have recruited our 751 patients. We've finalized maybe even more by now, 59% of those. Uh, we finalized the, oh, sorry, the course programs. We've had 62 dropouts, which is, you know, expect, expected, but not too much, which is pretty good. We completed 384 study, program, uh, study programs so far, and 235 of those patients or participants have actually had hearing aids uh, administered, which is pretty good. And it, of course, also means that we're still active. We have 305 active course participant programs. And most of them are just waiting for this final ENT specialist assessment to happen, you know, which occur after two to three months after treatment initiation. And a few of them we also have still in stage two where we're waiting for hearing aid administration and some further examinations, but we're really getting there. Hopefully we'll be done about April this year. So I don't have any final results for you, and I won't tell you about our results yet. We need the complete data set, but I can tell you what we intend to do before my, my talk is over. Of course, we intend to uh, document our data in manuscripts. We're going to study or an analyze I'm sorry, the patient safety of the new remote assessment routine, uh, the sensitivity, specificity of the new model uh, as a screening tool, again, for these complicating hearing loss. Uh, severe hearing loss, complicating conditions that need specialized care at a hospital department, and compare it to the sensitivity and specificity of the routine we know today to see if the new routine, the remote routine, may be equal to, hopefully, maybe even superior or inferior to what we know today. We also want to study the remote assessment process. We're going to calculate interpersonal assessment differences between the four remote assessors. And also we're gonna to try to establish some kind of competence level needed to perform remote ENT assessment in uh, specialist assessment in Denmark. We're gonna of course anal analyze our pro data, uh, talk about how treatment quality and patient satisfaction in the new, new uh, remote assessment routine hopefully is equal to what we know today. Um, and then, of course, we're going to document the translation process, process and the validation of this Danish adapted version of CEDRA, which is one of the elements in the standardized examination package. Yeah, so and that, I think we're going to have more manuscripts. We have so much data, so it'll be very exciting to see. Yeah, thank you. And if you want to check out our, web, our website and our, learn and read more about in here, you can go ahead and check it out. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. It was an exciting presentation, and I, I, I like the concept that you are working on. It, it's very promising. Just uh, one short question before we, we move on. Uh, what, is, uh, the, uh, uh, what is the attitude from doctors that see themselves being uh, squeezed out of the process? Well, we have cooperated broadly with uh, with the, the Danish ENT private practicing ENTs in Denmark and their association. So they've been in on the project the whole way. And so far, I think they're, they're interested in the results and I will be presenting these results for my colleagues here in the com, uh, for the coming uh, the, um, uh, a meeting. We have this research meeting in April this year and it'll be exciting to see. There is definitely a uh, 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 agreeable um, meaning meanings about this, but there may also be some skepticism, and uh, and we'll see for sure when we have the results. But I think it's a com you know combined it's combined uh, feelings of for and against. I think, yeah. Great. I wish you all the best luck. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Lena. You. Uh, moving on, uh, the next presentation is by two persons. It's uh, Johan Romley and Pernille Aubugel. Uh, they work as clinical research audiologists in Center for Applied Audiology Research at Oticon. They are both educated speech, language, 
hearing uh, pathology, pathologists from Copenhagen University. Uh, they started their careers as students in the same team, but now have multiple years of experience as full-time researchers where they find and communicate evidence for hearing technologies. Johanna and Panili will present Oticon's remote care, a solution that lets hearing care professionals uh, hold a, a virtual appointment with selected clients, including remotely adjusting their hearing aids and perform in situ audio, audio, audiometry. Besides, they will tap into the future of remote fittings. So uh, the two of you, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Biwa. Yeah. Okay, so I will uh, start by uh, sharing my screen. And first I'll say, well, both uh, Penilla and I are in the same room together. So that's really nice. So we'll just, uh, we'll just share this, this screen. Okay, so today we have um, quite a lot of ground that we will be trying to cover. Firstly, it'll be a brief introduction to Oticon Remote Care. Then we will present uh, how uh, the remote care appointments are uh, as experienced by a hearing care professional. And then we'll switch it to the parent perspective on uh, remote hearing care. And finally, a glimpse into what the future might look like. So introducing uh, Oticon Remote Care. In, uh, in essence, uh, Oticon Remote Care is a tool in Genie2, a uh, fitting software, that works with the Oticon Remote Care app to enable hearing care professionals to provide these remote follow-up appointments and fine-tuning of their clients' hearing aids. So these are the Oticon Bluetooth Low Energy Technology Hearing Aids, because they need uh, to connect to the app via this uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Technology. The hearing care professional and the client can uh, use the system to securely engage in a high quality video uh, chat and uh, text messaging, uh, providing a synchronous uh, help form. So that is the live connection with the client and the adjustments are made in real time. So this allows for in-situational support where the client is really struggling. And Oticon Remote Care is intended to provide ease and convenience for both the hearing care professionals and the clients, but it cannot replace the in-clinic uh, diagnostics or a first hearing aid fitting or the actual interaction or counseling of a hearing care professional. So the hearing care professional here is absolutely key. It is uh, ultimately a way to help clients and hearing care professionals to stay connected beyond the constraints of time, mobility, and resources. So then, who is it for? Uh, basically, anyone meeting uh, the technical uh, criteria. So you need to have compatible hearing aids with the uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Technology. So this goes back to open and then all the way to our new hearing aids, um, Oticon More. It also covers uh, Oticon Exceed, Exceed Play, Open S, et cetera. Um, and even the Oticon Cross and Cross PX devices. Uh, so to use this, the client must have an active email address um, and they must have the basic mobile device skills. Um, and they need uh, access to the internet because it's a uh, cloud-based, um, connection with the uh, fitting software, and they need a minimum speed of one megabyte. And then they need compatible devices, and this is uh, both iPhone and iPad uh, with iOS version minimum of 12. And uh, for Android devices, it's uh, Android OS version 8.0 or later. Um, so what can you use it for? It's been uh, touched upon uh, in many of these uh, presentations also from Erica earlier, but you can use it for counseling. Uh, you can use it for counseling hearing tactics, uh, device questions, and really understanding the nuances of a user-specific challenging environment. And you can get uh, further fine tuning done, do program changes or adjust feature settings. So there might be a complaint about the loudness of sudden loud sounds like crinkling paper or silverware. So you can then go and make adjustment to the transient noise management. 
Uh, from the clinic, the hearing care professional can adjust the balancing of uh, the cross uh, transmitter signal as well. And um, with remote care, the hearing care professional can also conduct in situ audiometry to determine the hearing thresholds and investigate if there's anything unusual about the client's hearing. Um, so with in situ audiometry, you get the tones generated by the hearing aids uh, without any special equipment. Um, and this allows for accurate and precise remote measurements, uh, which enables a personalized hearing experience taking the individual uh, ear acoustics into consideration. And uh, that was uh, a brief overview of uh, the Oticon Remote Care Solutions. And now over to Penilla. Thank you. As uh, Johanna just said, the uh, hearing care professional is, uh, is key in this. Uh, in this feature, and um, we would like to show you now a brief testimonial uh, from um, uh, Anna in uh, Sweden. She works in uh, Audi Care. So. <laughs> I'm Anna Sandin. I'm an audiologist working with remote care. The cases that I successfully used remote care are people that are interested, customers that are interested in new technique in general and are willing to participate in developing new and better hearing aids. To implement remote care to the clinic, clinic was really easy. I received information both in writing and through a colleague. The information was really simple to follow and once I received the access to all the programs, then it was easy to, to implement. My experience is that true benefits of uh, remote care is it gives me the possibility to give the customers a greater or higher service. It helps me to adjust the hearing aids to customers that have time limits or are unable for medical reasons to come to the clinic. It could be people that live abroad some parts of the year and they can have a, a appointment with me in the pool. I have quite a few cases of customers that I've used this on. One customer that I'm referring to is uh, a customer with a lung disease. He uh, has a great deal of problems, problems coming to the clinic. And he asked me yesterday if it was any possibility for him to adjust the hearing aids without him coming to the clinic. And I answered that yes, I most definitely have the possibility, possibility through this remote care. The future with remote care in, in, uh, in my clinic is that I believe I will use remote care more and more. Quite a lot of people would be helped with this product. Yes, so uh, that was uh, an experience of uh, a hearing care professional. And uh, now we will move to a different angle, and uh, that is the parent perspectives. Um, so today I will present some of the work of my colleague Dave Gordy uh, in, and his collaboration with Catherine Moyer at Rady Children's Hospital. Uh, so Gordy and Moyer did a webinar on audiology online recently called Parent Perspectives on Remote Hearing Care opportunities for developing self-determination. So if you find this snippet that I will be presenting today uh, of uh, Gordy and Moyer's work interesting, be sure to check out their webinar on uh, Audiology Online for more information on their work. Uh, today we'll dive into the research questions, uh, how do parents describe their experiences with uh, remote hearing care appointments? So in the study, uh, the participants were parents of young children who had the audiology services at Rady Children's Hospitals. They all wore uh, bilateral open play hearing aids and had remote hearing care appointments using both uh, the Oticon remote care app solution and Zoom. Uh, it was a qualitative study uh, containing eight parent interviews. Now, uh, their conclusions on the main benefits of using remote hearing care from the parent perspective was firstly, the parent's understanding of hearing loss. So their study found that parents' understanding of their child's hearing loss was very important to adherence to care and the relationship with their audiologist and supporting their children. 
secondly, they found uh, the further building of the parent audiologist relationship. So the research found that the parents value the relationship with the audiologist and the parent audiologist uh, report and respect was crucial to ensuring the child receiving optimal care and parents identified uh, trust uh, between these as being critical to the development of the relationship with the audiologist. Uh, lastly, uh, they highlighted um, parent engagement. Uh, so parents in this study reported a high level of engagement when participating in these remote hearing care appointments. Uh, so that's appointments from the comfort of their own home that facilitated these uh, engagement. And uh, one of the parents uh, even mentioned a realignment of the power balance in uh, medical appointments. And this uh, parent was referring to the feeling that you might have when you, they attend these medical appointments at large hospitals and clinics where there's a lot of structure, a certain set of behaviors that are encouraged and expected. Uh, and that's also a space where um, professionals, uh, there are professionals who are the experts and you're asked to step into their arena and, and participate. So with uh, remote hearing care, the parents felt that the discussions were more open and comfortable and organic. Um, so the parents found uh, remote hearing care useful as it reduced the travel time and reduced the time away from school for uh, their children and provided an intimate, quiet space to discuss their uh, children's hearing loss. Um, so Moyer and Gordy suggest that uh, future research investigates the rehabilitative opportunities of remote hearing care amongst a broader range of stakeholders, so also moving into daycare and school, etc. And they also suggest looking at how we might use remote hearing care as a tool to provide uh, consistent hearing aid use. So from talking about future research suggestions to having a look at what the future might bring, I pass the talks to you again, Penilla. Thank you very much. Good. So uh, obviously uh, remote care and remote fittings uh, in general is seen as uh, something of the present, but there's no doubt that it will also be something of the future. So now we would like to take a, although brief, uh, but a, a dive into the um, future of uh, hearing care and what it may contain. First up is uh, that the future may contain what is called the hybrid model. And the hybrid care model, it's a way of uh, delivering hearing care that combines the element of online services and remote care with in-person appointments. Um, and uh, uh, that can either be done real time or where data is collected and then sent for later interpretation and usage. So what has already been mentioned in synchronous and asynchronous uh, time. The insights presented on this slide uh, will mainly be um, based on the work of uh, our colleague, Hasmita Ratanji, Manmali, and her colleagues. Uh, you see the, the source uh, down below. And of course, we recommend that you uh, uh, go ahead and read it. But uh, in their research, um, they proposed a five-step hybrid model to support the patient uh, along the journey to better hearing. And one very interesting thing um, in their research was that they used this model in, in it while collecting the data, meaning that they actually opened up a clinic and saw real patients in uh, South Africa. And we hope that providing you with uh, this uh, brief introduction to the hybrid model may inspire you to see how uh, hearing care professionals can be as present, as visible, and provide, provide as much, much value as um, they do today in the future. So uh, here it is. It's uh, the five steps I just talked about. First step is online hearing screening, and that is obviously online, and uh, it was done asynchronous. So 665 uh, people in South Africa completed this online uh, validated hearing screening test on the clinic's webpage, and then they submitted their contact information. In step two, um, uh, that is called uh, patient readiness and motivation. And that was also online and uh, synchronous where the clinic audi audiologist contacted um, the people and assessed whether they were ready for um, hearing um, rehabilitation 
And for those that displayed readiness, they made uh, an appointment. The third step is diagnostic hearing evaluation. And that is the first step that's in person. And it is obviously done uh, in real time where they, um, the audiologist met with the patient either in the clinic or at their home. And the fourth step is also in person and in real time where patients were offered to um, try out bilateral hearing aids. And when their trial period ended, they could uh, purchase the hearing, age, uh, hearing aids, which 15 uh, did. And finally, in step five, uh, there was an, um, an audiological rehabilitation and a counseling like ongoing. And it was either done uh, online or in person uh, and in real time or uh, asynchronous. So uh, this uh, continuous therapeutic relationship uh, contained, for example, ongoing fitting sessions. And they wanted to ensure that the patients felt uh, supported throughout their journey to better hearing. A uh, very interesting conclusion of one of the studies was that even though 61% of all the uh, participants or patients had experience with uh, previous hearing care services, 95% rated that the service by this hybrid clinic uh, was more uh, favorable. And moving on to the uh, actual future, you may say I would like to present the future uh, hearing journey report from the uh, IDA Institute. IDA Institute set out to explore the, um, the future state of hearing care uh, and to understand the characteristics and dynamic of hearing care in five to 10 years from now. And they also wanted to anticipate the implications uh, for people with hearing loss and hearing care professionals, et cetera. They had a special focus uh, on uh, people-centered care. So they gathered data and insights uh, using surveys and focus groups, interviews and workshops. And they had nearly 1,500 participants, which is quite a lot. Today, we will present the um, most important findings uh, of the project related to online services in uh, hearing care. And we have combined them in uh, three themes, but um, please, Look up the report, uh, it contains a lot of valuable information for, for this profession. You may hear me use the word uh, telehealth, um, which means offering health or hearing health services through um, uh, the internet, uh, since this is the word that IDA Institute in, used in their report. First of all, um, telehealth is seen as a huge opportunity. So when hearing care professionals were asked to list the three main opportunities uh, of hearing care in the future, they rated telehealth as the biggest opportunity. And when the industry was uh, asked the same question, um, the people from the industry rated telehealth as number four out of 10 uh, biggest opportunities. And very interestingly was that when the people from the industry was asked um, what their, what their um, companies had done to prepare for the future, telehealth was rated number one out of 10. So meaning uh, the industry is really um, uh, striving to be prepared for, for this. Another interesting finding from the report is that um, the future may contain uh, the hybrid model. Uh, which I just talked about. So when people uh, with hearing loss, um, um, for people with hearing loss, 31 to 39% in two age groups uh, said that they were interested in this care model that combined the face-to-face -face with the remote uh, consultations. Um, this is a very interesting uh, result, uh, obviously, but they, uh, also uh, ranked that in-person appointments was uh, what they would prefer the most, though followed by the hybrid uh, care model. So remote care was seen by the participants as a convenient uh, additional offering, but they did not see it as essential. However, according to Ida Institute, this um, is very much expected to change as uh, now younger people age and will begin their patient journey.
And finally, the future may contain a big change or a theme seen as a, there will be a change coming. So uh, when Ida Institute asked people from academia what they had done to prepare for this change in, the, in hearing care, the second most chosen topic was that they, uh, they taught students how to deliver uh, teleaudiology and how to enhance uh, uh, counseling skills uh, through telehealth. And this may be a very important skill when uh, these students graduate, because according to IDA Institute, hearing care professionals will uh, need um, to consider how they're going to support the technological needs and limitations of themselves and the client um, more in the future than now. So according to uh, IDA Institute, some hearing care professionals will need to require a new skill set. A um, interesting um, and final comment in this regard is that some people with uh, hearing loss believe that consumers are actually more uh, ready or willing uh, than hearing care professionals to make the jump towards a, a world of more telehealth. So um, that will uh, conclude this uh, presentation from us. Yes. And uh, moving on to a Q&A Yes. So that's, uh, that's it from uh, Nila and I. And today you just heard briefly about the Otakon Remote Care Solution, uh, an experience of the hearing care professional and uh, parent perspectives, and then a glimpse into the future with the uh, hybrid models and uh, how the future might look from the IDA Institute report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penile and Johanna. It was uh, quite an interesting presentation you had on, on the Oticon approach and also the data that you had from South Africa. Um, now it's open for, for people to uh, ask uh, questions. Uh, and I would also like to, to ask the four of you now that uh, we have a little time to talk. Um, we, we are moving into the area of, of smartphones or it's all already around. And do you see um, the achievements that we get in the, the hearing aid um, rehabilitation? Is that just following up on, on what the expectations are in, in society that we should be moving on to, to smartphone on everything? Or are we feeling that we are actually coming a little bit in front of, of the development and doing more than, than, than just following suit to what is going on in society? Uh, would any one of you like to stick your neck out? I am. Um, I think I have a comment actually from the IDA Institute report. Uh, as far as I remember, they asked what the um, the um, people with hearing loss what they hoped for the future, and that was this combined uh, model and we have discussed today. But also, uh, they had a comment that um, people will expect this and they will actually use it to, to divide the clinics and say, I recommend this clinic because I can get that service. Uh, so I think that yeah. that may be a selling point also for clinics. A differentiator to be able yeah. to offer that service. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Erika, would you, would you have a comment on that? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that the way that the landscape is changing for hearing healthcare, um, the lines between a medical product and a consumer product are starting to become more blurred, even on our end. Um, so while we think of the smartphone as a consumer product, certainly, um, I think that the technology, the fact that it, it connects to a smartphone and you have earbuds that connect to smartphones that aren't medical devices and then the hearing aids are connecting to smartphones, they're starting to, the lines become blurred. And I think that it's more like, um, you guys just mentioned, it's more of an expectation of, well, if this can do it, why can't this do it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I put both of them in my ear and they, you, they should both connect to the phone. So I think as some of the consumer um, I, features that you see that are bought just in big box stores and things are starting to arrive in a medical device. I think that you, the expectation is that um, that they both should do it. So I, I don't I don't feel like we're really jumping the gun. I think that the expe expectation is already there with the technology, and we're just kind of bringing them both together. But. Um... 
becoming more consumer oriented in general, does that mean there will be a major change also in the whole hearing, uh, hearing aid industry? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that there, um, actually I was just typing the answer to somebody as well. I, I think that there's a, a place for both. Um, I think that if you think of your own healthcare and how you approach certain things in, in, that you deal with on a daily basis, uh, the older I get, the more aches and pains I get. And there's some things that I'll readily go to the doctor and get medical advice and expertise, and I'll invest a level of time and energy into certain problems. Other things, I just want to go to the drugstore and grab something off the shelf. And if that doesn't work, then I might lead, it might lead me into a doctor's office later. But I think hearing healthcare has really lacked that step, stepping stone approach. And we're starting to finally get into that where there's solutions that kind of lead somebody down their journey rather than um, only having one entry point. So I think that having many solutions doesn't mean that the other solution will necessarily go away. I think that it's more um, more options for more people that will bring them into the journey at different points, um, eventually maybe leading them to the to the point where their their level of investment is higher in terms of their time and and energy that the and money that they put into it. So I don't think that it's a one or the other choice. I think there's a spot for both actually. Yeah, and I think uh, sorry. Uh, I yeah, think no, go also, ahead. Um, the, the professional is still very much part of the journey, either either route you take, right? So there are still the uh, the experts are still there. You're not uh, left without anyone to hold your hand. So uh, that's that's also very important to remember. Thank you. And and now we have a question from Kil Konda. He's asking: Is there any regulatory issues when the patient's own phone is used as part of a medical uh, device system? And I, I believe that's something that you could help us uh, on, Lena. I'm sorry, I, I didn't think I, hear, I heard yeah, you. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, is there any regulatory issues when the patient's own phone is used as part of a medical device system? I'm not sure if that really goes to goes to me in parts of that question, maybe, but in in the sense of using it in the project that I've conducted in in here, uh, using a smartphone has been uh, for answering uh, surveys, online surveys. But you know, in the sense of the ENT specialist assessment process of of this, um, uh, using a device or using remote. Uh, consultation, I mean, having a conversation like uh, uh, what FaceTime offers or some kind of uh, uh, asynchronous conversation, but remote could also be a part of the ENT specialist assessment routine. In the future, we're not done kind of evol evolving or developing on this model. We're kind of using a prototype right now. So in the sense of just kind of having them in the initial part of the process of getting acquiring a hearing aid, you know, the smartphone, the smart devices can be very helpful to, you know, uh, gather information about the medical history as used in our uh, standardized examination package, but also maybe we could have as a new element to that, the prototype that we're using right now, having a conversation possible to you can actually talk to your patient, but they could actually be home and maybe do one or two visits instead of multiple visits with multiple uh, audiometry tests and so forth. So I think it kind of goes in line with what everyone else is uh, presenting here. Any other comments on, on the issue? Uh, I, I mean, when you are, are starting using a phone uh, for a lot of these sensitive communications, you're also opening some doors uh, to maybe a wider world uh, and there can be some legal issues as uh, the question I think uh, was uh, addressing. Uh, so there are probably a number of, of issues that are, uh, have to be tackled uh, correctly with respect to GDPR uh, yeah. and, and uh, ownership of data and, and whatever. Yeah, there are laws on what data that can be collected and stored within the, even within the manufacturer. Um, and then of course, how the data has been treated, if it's encrypted and things like that. So there absolutely are privacy laws um, and what information is stored 
if you've noticed, there's different types of um, consents or legal documents, depending on where you are, that the, either the patient or the clinician has to review before the system's being used. So there absolutely are, are uh, <laughs> regulatory issues around these mm -hmm. that, that need to be addressed before the system's released and all of the legal departments um, are involved, of course, when it comes to patient data and privacy. And, and another side of that is all the data that we are now generating uh, uh, in, 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 in the cloud somehow. Um, how will that be accessible, for example, for companies to use that data? Uh, how will it be accessible for uh, people doing research, et cetera? Uh, it's it's a, a very difficult issue because who owns the data? Is it the patient or is it the clinic uh, that is helping generating the data? Is it the manufacturer of the hearing aid, et cetera? But I, 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 can, I can see uh, a lot of uh, difficult uh, questions, but it would be nice if some of those data can be used uh, for the, the goods of people, but also we would not like the data to be uh, uh, taken up by some of the, the high-tech companies just for um, making a lot of money, <laughs> I, I assume. So Exactly. <laughs> and, there, and personal data isn't required to, to have success with data. Um, you know, it, it, we don't need to know people's locations or names or very personal information about themselves to to be able to do interesting things with data, but there's absolutely laws around it on what can be stored or collected or who owns the data. Um, but uh, that is it, that is outlined to the patient. Yeah, I, I think it's a discussion that will be coming up more and more in the, in the years to come. In, in Denmark, we pride ourselves of having a lot of uh, uh, healthcare data. Uh, but the, the, the real problem is that a lot of these data are in different formats, so we cannot really uh, make use of the data. And the next question is, who should be allowed to have access to the data? And uh, we are just a small part of that a big discussion, but I, I hope that somehow over the, the coming years, uh, we can have uh, a, a more straightforward approach because uh, it, it all... Uh, points to in the direction of artificial intelligence and, and use of big data and, and how can that be used. But uh, I don't think we will come up with the answers here today, uh, just that uh, it's, it's a major issue. But I can see we are running over time now. Uh, uh, so uh, I would like uh, to thank the four of you for your very excellent presentations. It's been very enjoyable uh, to see what is, is already uh, uh, being done out there commercially and what is in progress, uh, for example, in, in the case of in here. And, and I'm pretty sure we'll hear a lot more of these issues in, in the years to come. So thank you very much for, for your very fine contributions uh, uh, here today uh, from me. And I'm pretty sure from a lot of the people that attended this presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to add something, Fiora, before we uh, before we stop great. for today. Yeah, um, great. First of all, I'm not sure why my video won't start, but we'll manage with that. I, I thought it was a, a sign that I should stop. <laughs> not at all. No, it just stopped working <laughs> and now it won't switch on again. Um, but I just wanted to mention, uh, as you're having the discussion there, that we're also planning a webinar about the collection of ha and handling uh, of of this kind of data in the hearing aid industry. So um, watch out for that one. And also mm -hmm. another one about the uh, kind of blurred lines between consumer audio and medical devices. So uh, that will be later this spring. But uh, okay. yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Thanks to everyone for your great presentations and for all of our attendees and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.